The old inn at Carbost on the Isle of Skye is legendary for its music sessions. I once stumbled in there on a very cold and wet night and there were about four other people drinking at the bar and there were five musicians sitting around the table giving it their all, a pipe player, a fiddle player, a guitarist, a, a bodrum player, all playing for the sheer love of music. And during the Small Halls Festival in November, when some of Scotland's finest musicians came together to tour around the little venues on Sky, there was an extraordinary atmosphere as everyone packed into the old inn on a Sunday afternoon to hear them give their all. You can hear playing there Megan Henderson, Hamish Napier, Rachel Newton, who we walked with on Sky, and the amazing pipe player Jarlath Henderson. And we're going to hear his story now. So I'm by the river, looking up at the mountains with the piper, the singer, the whistle player, Jarlath Henderson, who's one of the people on this Small Halls Festival. What's been the highlight for you so far? The highlight so far? Ooh. Um, the first concert was great, just because it was all eight musicians together. That was uh, lovely. Where was that? Um, that was over in Kailakin, just on this side of, just on the sky side of the Sky Bridge. I think that was the perfect way to start it, with a really big gig and Kaylee and some gorgeous food um, from some lovely folk down in Glen Elg. So it was just perfect, great way to start. It must be a wonderful atmosphere on this tour. It's really nice. I'm one of the lucky ones here. I, I did it last year as well, and it's lovely. It's it's a lovely thing to be in one place, e.g. on Sky, you know, in its entirety. But then every night you're going to another little different place and engaging with another lovely group of people, you know. And every hall is different. Like, you know, some of the halls are so small and very wooden on the inside, and other ones are, have just a totally different vibe. But, uh, and it's amazing the effect that that has on the performance. It's kind of now cool. Now, you've got the pipes you know? here with you. Yeah. Uh, tell, tell us about these pipes. What kind of pipes are they, and yeah. are they so this, special in any way? Well, this is a set of Illin pipes. This is a, a set pitched in B which is uh, what, what people refer to as flat pipes. They're more mellow in their sound and they're based on sort of older instruments. These are based on a set that were made in about 1830 or 1840, uh, but they were made by a German, an amazing German pipe maker called Andreas Raga. Will you take them out and start them course, on? I'll show you how they work. So the Illin pipes get their name because Illin is the, the Irish word for elbow and you pump it using your elbow 
and a set of bellows. So and you're strapping um, the bellows around your yeah, waist. Yeah, they go the around. They go around my waist. And then I've got this large, sort of long part of the instrument. Looks a bit like an octopus. And it has three drones. The big long one with the ribbon on the end, and then these. Actually, this set has four. So one, two, three, and a little extra one here. And then these kind of amazing, kind of very distinctive parts of a set of Illin pipes, these, these keys are what's called regulators, and they provide like a chordal accompaniment with your wrist and with your thumb, um, along with this bit, which is the, the chanter, obviously, uh, where the melody gets played. Right. So uh, that's a full well, well that's you, And then you need to set. assemble them. Uh, you need to assemble them. Why do you them. sit on this rock? I'm going to sit on my hat on yeah. this rock. And I'll move the case. Thanks very much. It's kind of spoiling the view, isn't it? <laughs> So they all kind of assemble together into something, I don't know, resembling an, a weapon <laughs> of some form, <laughs> which it maybe could be described as. They're, they're a solo instrument, primarily. Um, well, is that because they're so loud they don't blend with anything else? Actually, on the contrary, you're going to find how quiet these are. They're really, really mellow. You no know, traditionally pipers as well as harpists in sort of... 16th, 17th, 18th century Ireland were associated with a large lairdship or a house where they would have performed solo for guests and at stately events and that's kind of where the instrument originated. Um, so yeah, very different to the kind of more militarised uh, you know, structure of what was going on with Highland pipes. Right. You know, very much. Can you give us a little... I tune? can, yeah. Um, they're, uh, I'll have to give them a tune and see what they think of playing it outside. So that's, it's, it's an act of concentration, isn't it? Because you, you are using all sorts of different parts of your anatomy. <laughs> yes, you are. You are. You're stopping it on your leg there, for example. Yeah, you leave the chanter sat on your leg. It's a total closed chanter, which actually the only other sort of closed chanter like this where you can actually stop the, the air going through it is the Northumbrian pipes in, from England, you know. Otherwise, it's a, a constant... You constantly have to be blowing air through the pipes. Whereas with this, I can fill it up with air and close everything off and... Uh, get the sound of silence which you don't often get from a set of pipes right so that's kind of cool um yeah so people will have recognized from your accent that you're not a native scotsman i'm not no <laughs> no i'm a blue you're, you're from northern ireland i am yeah, yeah yeah i was born in armagh uh, and i grew up in county tyrone just not too far away moved there when i was 10 and i've been over in scotland since i uh, since i finished school uh, i came over here and played music for a year i was playing solo quite a bit so where did you learn the pipes? So I learned the pipes in Armagh with the Armagh Pipers Club, which is a great institution altogether. It's been going since 1966, and my mother went there for a period of time. She was from Armagh. It's run by the Vallelys, Ethna and Brian Vallely, who are totally amazing people. They actually brought me to Skye for the first time, age 13, to go to Feshinari here. And I was a pupil there for about four or five years when I then began teaching there for the later years of my secondary school. Um, it's a club. It's outside of school hours, it happens in the evenings in Armagh uh, and they offer lessons on so many different instruments and really encourage kids to play music and form bands and they're just a wealth of knowledge and experience and uh, really great, they're, they're total kind of role model figures for me. And you obviously did really well really young because you were the youngest ever winner of the Radio 2 Young Folk Award, weren't you? <laughs> That's right, yeah. yeah. How old were you when you won that? Uh, I was 17, right. so yeah, I was actually in my last year of school um, and it was a great thing to win, although... It definitely put the pressure on. I was sort of, I should have been getting ready to study from A levels at the time. And so, all the agents uh, started ringing, presumably. Well, it, it got a bit busy, you know, and I didn't really know what exactly to do with it, but I did what I could, and um, I did, well, I did everything I could really, and then 
it's kind of May time knuckled down and just got myself through my A levels. Yeah, and you got through your A levels in presumably science subjects, some science subjects, and, yeah. and then of course music, so right. and, and Irish as well. So, so you yeah. did science subjects, music, and Irish. Yeah, and then you went on to study to be a doctor. I did. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I took a, I took a year and played an awful lot of music and did everything I could, and. Uh, then I went to Aberdeen and continued to play lots and lots of music um, and somehow at the same time <laughs> kind of squeezed in a medical degree. So I was I was running away on Thursday evenings and returning on Monday evenings and squeezing in what I could. And, uh, and are you still up. pursuing <laughs> medicine alongside your music? Yeah, I, um, I'm still working in emergency medicine uh, and I love it. And it's great. I work as a locum now. I'm able to take as much work as I can and you know step away from work whenever I do have a run of gigs or if I need to go into the studio uh, I'm going back to study uh, to be a GP as well starting in, in February so yeah still still going I mean I, I couldn't do one without the other really at this stage I think the two kind of keep me sane or insane whichever Do you it find is, the music you know? is a relief from some of the drama and some of the emotion of, of the medicine? Yeah, but sometimes the medicines are relief from some of the drama of the music. So, oh, really? <laughs> no, yeah, I, the two of them, I, I, I um, the two of them sort of very much, you know, do complement each other. I, I sort of like the balance that that has for my life. A stage, I really enjoy it. You know, a lot of people say, "Oh, would you not sort of not do the the medicine and just go and be a music?" You know, you know, you could do it, but no, no, I, I love being a doctor. Like, so that's very much what I want to continue doing uh, alongside and I'm, I'm very grateful that I'm in a position where I can do both you know um, Would you play for us? Yeah What would you play sitting here on a rock on oh, the Isle of Sky on, on a cold day? Well maybe we should do a big old air um, as you just said we're, we're, we're on a rock and you just made me think of a, a great old air called Anrotu Egan Garig uh, Were You at the Rock is literally the translation it was recorded by Seamus Ennis a fellow RTE and BBC man who was in these parts swimming off these coasts in the 60s. And it's a, a code song from the penal times in Ireland. And it would have been sung on a, sun, or a Saturday evening to give signal as to whether it was actually safe to go to the rock the following day to practice mass. So the second verse, if it was stated as a positive, returned to the question, were you at the rock? That meant it was OK. You could go the next day. So, um, yeah, that's on Road to and Garrig. So I'll, I'll give it a try here on the, on the rock.
So that was beautiful. And Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm just interested in why it is that you think you took to the pipes so well. What is it, is it about the instrument that you love so much? Good question. Uh, so I have to tell you that at seven, I was sent to piano lessons. My older sister, Laura, who's 14 months older than me, was a very gifted pianist. I, at that age, really wanted to be riding bikes and climbing trees and was probably a, a terrible pupil. In fact, I, I just wasn't interested. I also was quite a hyperactive kid uh, and didn't really stop. So I guess at the ripe old age of eight, having got through my grade one just about, or I, I, I kind of packed it in. And that was me. I, was, I, was, I wasn't musical. That was the way I looked at the world. Uh, it was only when we moved from Armagh to Dungannon in County Trone, which was 12 miles away, that I think obviously Mum felt it was important for us to go to the Pipers Club where she had been and we were sent over. And kind of instantaneously, I really took to the, the whistle, just for a few weeks, really, but I really got into it. And then I saw this crazy instrument called the Pipes. Now, it wasn't a crazy instrument to me because my father plays the Pipes and... I guess I thought in my naive little world that everyone's dad must play the pipes, you know. On a Sunday night, whenever I got out of my bath and there was some, you know, I, I thought the same thing happened in every other house up and down the country, you know. But, um, yeah, so that, that kind of was it. I moved over from Whistle after probably only a month or two and started learning the pipes. And I wasn't probably a model student at the start. Again, sort of hyperactivity, I would say, rules. And I can remember having a very strict talking to from Brian Vallely at one stage when I came into the class after a few weeks and hardly could put the damn things on you know and he was like well you know I don't know if this is for you and I don't and I was so mortified and embarrassed as a little kid and I went home to mum and dad and I said I'm not doing this anymore I'm done with this um, and dad said well you know Jarlath if the pipes are too hard for you you can always play the accordion or something like that at which stage I firmly felt the need to defend myself and literally within a few weeks after that I was 100% hooked and perhaps it is something about the very um, temperamental nature of the pipes. You need to focus and you need to be 100% engaged with the instrument. It's a very physical instrument. Things let you down. I mean, playing out here is, is lovely and it's really nice to get the opportunity, but you never know what such cold, dry air can, can do. And, and uh, that's, that's one of the, the terrible and, and joyous things about playing the pipes. Um, but yeah, you have to be 100% engaged and it definitely gave me a focus. Um, so your mind, which had previously sort of whirled around a lot, suddenly found a way of being still and, and, and I think concentrating. So. I think so, you know, it, and it did become that. It became a, a release in times of any sort of minor childhood anxiety. You know, I would get up in the morning and play pipes for half an hour before I went to school from, at eight o'clock. I would come home from school and I'd put on my dad's LPs of Paddy Keenan and Seamus Ennis and Leo Rosen, one after the other, as I sat and did my homework. And then I would promptly pick up the pipes and play. It became my football and it became the thing that I would do if life got tough or, you know, whatever your, whatever was tough for a kid at 14 or 15. But this was, the, this was my sort of my rock very much at that stage. And... Um, Again, it wasn't cool, you know, to play trad music. It, it now is a lot more cool, but back then it wasn't. And uh, you know, did you get so, teased by your friends? At times, yeah, yeah, I yeah. did. I mean, I was maybe a bit of a studious kid and fairly sensitive in some ways. And I, I moved into a secondary school full of boys. It was all boys, Catholic secondary school. And yeah, it wasn't cool, to, as I said, to play the pipes. But again, that just made me play more. And actually, what happened was you, you lived for the summers. And I know we, we, a lot of other musicians will talk about this. And you know, during school, you felt quite misunderstood. Whereas when it came to the summer in Ireland and you could be going from Milltown Malby to Tubber Curry to the Joe Mooney and Three Flas and every other week, you could literally pack up with your tent and your instruments and, and go and you wouldn't see your parents for months on end. And, and you were you surrounded didn't. by teenagers who had exactly the same hobbies and interests as you did. And here were people that you actually wanted to impress and wanted to go out with or, you know, have a snog with at the end of the night and <laughs> things like this. And then lo and behold, the All Ireland Flap kind of period at the end of August finished and everyone got that sinking feeling in their stomachs and it was back to school for another year, you know. Duncan great. Chisholm said that you're sometimes known as the Jimi Hendrix of the pipes. <laughs> <laughs> Do you mind that? Well, I, I don't... I, I'll tell you what, I know that, that there's at least... behind your head? Oh, no, I don't know. <laughs> there's at least two other pipers who, um, who, who uh, have been called that, I'm sure, in their day.
I like to be um, free on the instrument. I, I, I love also sort of settling down and thinking of, of piping as a really controlled thing, which it is and which I love doing. But uh, yeah, maybe sometimes I just get a wee bit too caught up in the moment. But I don't make any apologies for that, you know. Um, I love listening to sort of jazz and modern music and music with more improvisation in it. And I don't mind in sort of whatever naturally comes from that into my piping. I'm, I'm sort of happy with that. I don't make any apologies for it. We should say that you also sing. Yeah, and, I do. Um, and people have compared your voice to Paul Brady. I'm which is lucky about that. Which yeah. is a nice thing to happen, isn't Tell it? Tell me about it. Yeah. Um, so what's the repertoire that you sing? I guess it's a bit of a mix. I would mostly sing in English. I'm not a fluent Irish speaker, although I speak Irish, but I haven't really ventured into recording any songs in Irish yet. But most of what I would sing would be folk stuff from England, Ireland, Scotland. Traditional ballads, particularly songs that relate to me. Would you sing for us now? Yeah, yeah, I'll give you a song. Again, it's nice being outside. It kind of makes you feel very in touch with nature and everything. And maybe I'll sing a song that is called Old Arbo. It's a song that I got from the singing of my sister. Uh, and I think she got it from Sarah Ann O'Neill, who was a singer from the southern shores of Loch Ney, quite close to Dungannon, where we, ma- we moved to. And it's a very old place, Arbo, uh, on the south banks of Loch Ney. It would have been a Viking settlement at times, and there's high crosses, Celtic crosses there. So I'll give that a bash. Ye gods assist my poor weary notion Inspired muses, lend me your hand To exalt my quill without blot or blemish While I sing the praises of this lovely land that's well situated in the north of old Ireland, all in the county of sweet Tyrone, all along the banks of Loch Ness bright water. Lies that ancient fabric they call old Arbo. Oh, stand a while and view the harbour where swirling streams run to and fro where fishers sport both night and morning Yield of their bounty to old Ardbold No serpents lurk in its hallowed waters No odours poison or infest the breeze Yet peace and plenty for sons and daughters Who abound around you are old Loch Ness Oh, I've travelled France and I've travelled Flanders and all the countries beyond the Rhine. Yet in all my rakings and undertakings Aren't bow your equal I never will find. 
My course it is set for the Indian Ocean. I have walked through Cana and Galilee. Yet in all my wreckings and undertakings, hard bow your equal I never have seen. It seems it seems interesting to be hymning Ireland here in Scotland. I know, yeah, <laughs> yeah, but in such beautiful landscape amazing isn't it yeah Yeah. so do you feel now at home in scotland and with the scottish music scene i do yeah um and it gives me a lovely longing for a home as well which is lovely but i do feel at home here the people are very similar Uh, i I see massive similarities and culturally and historically and in modern day as well um goes well as kind of the capital of donegal in many ways uh, and only a 25 minute flight from belfast so i'm in a good location you know i'm in a where I want to be right now. <laughs> it, was, it was a great feeling to be in the old inn at Carbost and hear you playing yesterday. We were absolutely crammed in. Yeah. How did it feel from your perspective? Great, really great. That's my second time there in about a month with, with two different projects and I was there last year as well and the, the feeling, you know, it's a great place. I think there was, yeah, 200 bodies in there or something yesterday. And, Certainly sweaty. You know, it, was, it was warm, I'll tell you. <laughs> um, it was probably the busiest I've ever seen it. Um, but the people there are lovely, they love the music and it just, um, yeah, what a happy, happy pub in a beautiful place. Thank you very much for talking to us today, Jarlat. It's been wonderful. Thank you very much. Lovely. Nice to meet you, Matthew. Cheers. Jarlath Henderson on the Isle of Skye. There are more episodes of Folk on Foot coming in Season 5 in the summer. In the meantime, while we're working on it, we'd be really grateful for any donations you might make to help us cover our costs. Just go to the website, folkonfoot.com, and click on the Support Us button. Every little helps keep us on the road. And while you're waiting for Season 5, why not go back through the back catalogue of Folk on Foot and enjoy all the other glorious episodes? <laughs>